It's a long, frustrating wait. Some of these boats have been tied up since before Christmas, and now it's the middle of February, and winter has a firm hold. These are small inshore draggers, and they've come here to Port of Basque to get in on the winter cod fishery. The boats are ready to go. The decks have been shoveled off, and the ice has been knocked from the winches and the cables. The trouble is, outside the shelter of Port of Basque Harbor, it's blowing a gale. There's nothing to do but wait. There are 52 boats here for the winter fishery, all 65 feet long or less. Bigger draggers aren't allowed to fish these inshore waters. There are boats from many ports, some from around Port of Basque, some from Nova Scotia and the Magdalen Islands, and many more from Port of Schwa and Anchor Point on the northern peninsula. All must wait on the weather. Finally, the gales drop off, and the boats are on the water. When the fishery starts, it goes at a frantic pace. That's been the pattern of this fishery. It only started in 1978, when the federal government decided to open a winter dragger fishery off the southwest coast. Cod stocks were coming back to these waters, and small draggers were given licenses to fish here, almost as an experiment. At first, there were only a dozen boats, but the catches were good, and the word spread. By 1981, there were 42 draggers here. The quota was 11 million pounds of codfish. It was load and go. The fish was hauled aboard and dumped down in the hole. The plants were buying the fish round. There was no splitting or gutting to hold things up aboard the draggers. They caught the 11 million pounds in just 10 fishing days. The boats and the plants worked round the clock until suddenly it was all over. The fisheries department took a hard look at what happened in 1981 and came up with a plan to make this fishery last longer. The total quota was raised to 14 million pounds. Each boat was given its own quota. It could catch no more than 100,000 pounds of cod a week. From now on, the fish would have to be split and gutted aboard the boats. Not only would this slow down the draggers, it would also mean a better quality fish. At first, the fishermen complained, mainly because they didn't feel the companies were offering enough money to justify the extra work. But eventually, they agreed to the changes, in exchange for a price of 22 cents a pound for the gutted fish. Yet in spite of the new rules, the pumps at the T.J. Hardy plant in Port of Basque have had a job keeping up with the catches. Some draggers are taking their weekly 100,000 pound quotas in just two or three days. So much fish is coming in that the plant can't handle it. The plant's owner, T.J. Hardy, decides to buy only 20,000 pounds a day from each boat. That way he can make the fishery last, and that means steady employment for the more than 600 people who work at his plant. But even with the daily quotas, there's still more fish than one plant can handle. So tractor trailers arrive to take fish to other plants, one of them 430 miles away in Clarenville. In the Port of Basque plant, the emphasis is on quality. In previous years, when the fish came in round, quality was a big problem. The most thing we want here is quality. Quality is number one. That's the first thing we want. You see a bunch of fishery officers around here? Well, they're welcome at any time, but we don't have any trouble with them. Because we are quality-wise our own stuff. What's the quality like this year as compared to last year with the bleeding and gutting? Well, the quality is, is over 50% bitter. We haven't got so much bruised fish this year as we had last year. But fish were fired around with the gut in and jumping around on it. Now the fishermen come in and they rip the fish and we don't bite it until it's ripped. I could, we could, we are paying 22 cents for fish, but we could bought that same fish for 15 cents with the gut into it. Well, what have you got? A bunch of junk, all number two fish. You just can't get away with it. 
In spite of all the wrangling over quotas and prices and gutting the fish, there's a good feeling around the docks. Everyone seems happy to be busy at a time when much of the fishery is still closed up for the winter. There's excitement in braving the cold weather and the ice to bring in great loads of fish. But there are dangers in this fishery as well. Wallace Mead has just signed on as a deckhand aboard this boat. Just a few days earlier, Wallace was skipper of his own dragger, a 60-footer built in Nova Scotia. But his boat got into a shoving match with some pack ice, and the boat lost. Well, we left home that morning around 7.30 and we went on, on past Cape Ray, and when we were passing Cape Ray, we uh, got a report from uh, some of the bigger draggers a few hours before that, left uh, the whole 15 miles west of Cape Ray. So we didn't have any worries, or didn't think we did, about uh, being in Broadway with hoist that day. So we could see, uh, as we thought, we could see open water all day to the southeast the way we had to come back. So we fished there till uh, 6.30 that evening. And we uh, ate it back, and uh, we didn't come no time before we got in the hoist. But, well, what I'm thinking might have happened, that the, the hoist that was on the inside of us all day, on the land side, might have, uh, the tide might have turned it and trapped us in. But, uh, we were drifting landward all the time. We were heading offshore the last two or three hours, but still we were drifting on the land, almost there at first. We had a nice bit of fish into her. Uh, she was about half loaded, or maybe a little bit, or about 35,000 pound of fish. And she was, uh, the boat loads by the stern, the way the boat is laid out. All the fish was in the stern of the boat, and it was cocked up. But uh, I was up on the bill uh, just to have a look around and uh, see if I could see a, a easier way out. And when I got back in the Willows, one, one of the crew came in and they said uh, the water coming over the stern of the boat. So I looked back, and when I looked back, she was, I could see her going, the stern of the boat was going down. So whatever happened must have happened. What do you think happened to her? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I think we punctured, punctured, we must have punctured a hole, uh, you know, trying to maneuver through the house. I made a, a distress call on uh, uh, the HF, because that's where all the, the other boats were. Uh, there was a lot of fishing boats coming down that way, but most of them were two and three miles ahead. And I made the distress call, and I told them that we had to, uh, I had to go to the house, the boat was going down, going down fast. And then there were a chance to say nothing else. We, uh, a couple of the guys uh, decided to go to uh, cut the dory loose. But when they got up there on, on the roof of the house, I seen her going, I made them get out of it because they wasn't going to have time to get her off. And if we had if we had stayed on the house to get the dory off, she would have rolled over while we were getting the dory off. So you were standing on the ice for how long then before you well, got picked up? I was only on the ice for half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour, because there was another boat there from, uh, from Port of Swallow, Rich Point, Clyde Palmer. And he was having problems with the ice too, but he, he drifted the inside of the shoal that we were scared of. So he heard the distress call, and he, and he saw our lights, he saw us going down. And uh, so he started to head for us, doing the best manner he could, but he couldn't get very fast because, say, you know, he only had much the same boat that we had. And uh, he put the spotlight up towards us, he saw us on the ice. And it wasn't a dark night, the moon was shining, beautiful night. So he, he maneuvered the best he could, and we walked towards the boat. We wasn't more on the ice more than half an hour. So how would you describe the whole experience? Well, you don't get scared, uh, or I don't, not uh, when something like that is happening. It says after it's over, you think it's back over it. What, what kind of a lesson did you learn about fishing and ice? Well, there's something you got to try, try to stay clear of, no matter what you got, unless you really got an ice breaker. But uh, it goes to show that you really got to be careful. There have been other narrow escapes, but they don't stop the draggers from casting off and heading out into the rough weather and the ice. This fishery has been too good to sit in port and worry about that kind of thing. Alf Gould of port has been coming here since this fishery started in 1978. In the second year I was here, uh, Cape, uh, north of Cape Ray, between Cape Ray and Cape Anguilla there, there was five miles of fish there, 25 fathom deep. I steamed over with a sounder on. Now that's only what was under my boat, and then there was boats scattered all over the place, so I'll give you an idea what kind of a body of fish was there. Alf was one of the first dragger fishermen to come to Port of Basque for the winter fishery. He did so well that he got a bigger boat, the L.J. Kennedy, a 65-footer built in Port of Schwa, and named after the man who built her. 
How many boats were there back then coming up? Well, that year, that was five years ago. There was uh, 13 boats that year come up. We never done too much with it. Bad weather. Wind, gales of wind all the time. There was lots of fish, but we couldn't get on the water. Eh? So the next year, five of us come back. The next year after that, there were five boats come back here. You're saying that uh, people thought you were foolish to come up here? Well, first when we started, yes, well, uh, we was, I guess, because we had too small a boat to be up around or fooling around with. We didn't realize that it was so bad up here. The winter up here is a lot worse than it is on our coast. Gales and gales, I mean, all, all day long up here blows. Don't know how to drive out. A couple of hours steam from Port of Basque, we reach the scattered slob ice that marks the edge of the ice pack. Soon the pans get bigger and closer together. Bad ice this year is rough ice, heavy ice. Heavy ice. Well, it's not so bad as it sounds. It sounds it's like hitting a barrel. You know, you hit a barrel, it sounds like it hits in there. It makes a noise. Oh, drum, but the uh, keep banging and snocking. And as protection against the ice, these draggers have extra wood sheeted to their hulls. The green heart, we call it. It's three quarters of an inch thick. That's, that's screwed on over, over the, the boat, right? over the hull of the boat, over the plank. And it's hard, it won't cut with ice. So she can take a pretty good smack, this one. So a little, little smacks like that don't hurt her. Try to keep her in between the bands, like so that she don't force right into it. And she'll squat it down as she goes over. Still take your time. Oh yeah, you gotta ease them to dice. You can beat one of those up. Hey, eh? you mind a runner in those, you wouldn't last no time. You would have nothing only the wheel in your hands. <laughs> yeah. Nearby, other boats are already dragging, butting their way through strings of ice. While his crew waits, Alf studies the markings on his fish finder. Any good marking? Yeah, that's good, good, real good there, yeah. 20 fathom of fish there. 20 down on the 40 fathom of fish there to break in. So that big black lump there along that line, that's, that's, that's fish. fish. How do you know what kind of fish it is? Well, you can pretty near tell on his cod, you know. It's more in bunches, like hay poops. The black smudges along the bottom look good, but Alf must find a place to shoot out his nets. Finally, he reaches open water, and the order is given to put out the gear. With so many boats around, you've got to be careful where and when you start your tow. When you got all these boats, 50 boats going back and forth, do you ever get in one another's way? Do you ever get yeah. problems? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of times, yes. Hooked up, snarled up. We've had some bad, bad miss. What happened? Well, you get two, two rigs hooked together, two nits tangled up. You know, one followed in, you might. I haven't had to do it yet, but uh, there have been cases where fellows had to cut it off and let it go, eh? One boat take it all aboard and go in and clear it up on the land was the only way to do it. One boat drags the net across another boat. Well, one boat dragging it across another boat and, and get the, we're towing two doors and a big net and, uh, and the other boat is doing the same thing. So you got four big doors and two big nets snarled up. Now, well, what happens then, you know, you got fish in the net thing and two nets got fish in and the fish floats up. Keeps winding up, and, oh, you couldn't believe it, how bad a mess you can get. One bag of fish will go around another one and all this and that. Oh, we've had some bad mess. 
better use good judgment. You better use good judgment, and everybody got to look out for one another. If you don't, some fellas don't feel like moving out of the way a little bit because they might see a few fish under the boat or a few fish under sounder. They don't feel like hauling away, eh? But everybody got to give one another a berth because of it, and uh, then there'll be no trouble. Even if you don't get tangled with another boat, there's always the danger of snagging the bottom. I suppose you must worry that every. The longer you let the tow go, the more chance you have of snagging something Oh, the yeah, yeah. Well, yesterday, see, we could have had 50,000 pounds in the net. We hooked up just as we was going to haul back, so then the motor that net is open big as a house or bigger, you know, and the fish, what keeps the fish back in the net is the, the speed we're going, eh? They can't swim as fast as we're going, not for a very long time. So when they all go back in the end of the net, we're going to hit and they can't come out. But when you get hooked up, you stop, see? Sometimes there's a strong tide here, the nit will turn right inside out. Same as you turn your mitt inside out. So whatever's in there is dumped out. So that's the little worry when you're towing through that kind of fish. More than a little. You're going to hook up. More than a little worry. Yeah, it's a big worry. You could lose $1,000 worth of fish or more. Now, there's a lot of small reed fish here in this area too. You know, right here where we're doing now, it could be small reed fish. Alf's fears prove right. The net pops to the surface and it's bright red. It's a good tow, and there is a lot of cod mixed in with the redfish. But Alf has little use for the redfish. Oh, well, they're all right, but uh, right now we're looking for cod, eh? We'd rather keep it clear of them right now, the time being. The redfish today up there in the deep water, they're gone right on the bottom, same as the cod goes sometimes, eh? So it's a job to tell. She's marking fish, the sound is showing fish, and you can't. Uh, you can't tell what kind it is because it's down to you on the bottom and you've got to try to see what it is. I was hoping it was cod, if it was cod we'd had a lot, but uh, it was a lot of redfish, a lot of redfish there. They're hard, it gets in among the codfish, they're hard to handle. Eh? There's so many tarns and everything, we're not properly rigged for handling. We need shoots and everything, one thing or another, you know, to get them, put them in the hole, keep them clear of the cod, eh? How much do you get for uh, redfish now? There's nine cents, there's no price marked on there, but I think there's nine cents a pound. Does that go against your quota for codfish? Not as I know. I don't think. I don't hope it do. If I do, we'll go back and shovel it overboard. Maybe I'll get some cod next next time around. Oh yeah, we'll get a few for us for a day of cod. We move to deeper water to try and get clear of the redfish. Then it's time for another tow. The markings on the fish finder are better than last time. It looks like a good tow. How do you feel when you get into a, a tow like this? Oh, it feels good. It feels good. What's what you're looking for? That's what you're looking for. What's showing up there now? That's what you come to look for. Pretty sure it's all cod fish, right? Well, it looks like cod. It looks good. So I think it should be. There's a lot of fish here now. You're in a bit of ice now. Yeah. You don't like to see that, I suppose. No, not today. You get a new patch of ice, what problems does that cause you? Oh, well, we can't tow it through close pack, though. You say we can't get the gear out. But what happens when you run into some ice in the middle of a tow? Well, a small, narrow string of ice, we, we tie the cables in. Uh, we take the cables into the stern of the boat so close as we can get them in the tide from the blade. Say, in the tide from the blade, we'll keep the ice clear from the cables and we can manage to go through a half a mile string, things like this, but we can't take back into ice because the net floats up amongst the ice, and we gotta keep going to hit on the net to keep the fish back and the cod in, and then she fills up full ice and we can't get it out. So we can't we can't take back or, or sit out in ice. 
If you left your cables out, if we didn't bring them back and tie them on, what would happen? Oh, she'd come up on a pan and take the gear right out of the water. The cable would hook up on the nice pan? Yeah, a small pan of ice. A pan of ice that can't flow to man to bring an 800 pound door up, whatever's going on. <laughs> lots and lots of times we got to take back for a little pan of ice about six foot square. So we're scared of ice. And it's going so fast with the tides there, you know, if you happen to get hooked in the bottom, and the ice come down on you, you can lose your boat, eh? Pressure of ice, uh, spike your boat up. We get through without a hitch, and the crew gets ready to haul back. With 52 boats all fishing in this small area, you'd think there wouldn't be enough fish to go around. We got 50 boats up here now, maybe more next year. Is it the same as it used to be? Oh, it's still, still lots of fish. Everybody is getting fish. Lots of fish. So far. Not too many boats, though, is there? Well, it's not it. Know if they don't keep mine coming, <laughs> it's not all. The ball is in that island, no problem, will be okay as well. We're going to sit here now. This time, it's a good catch. A few more like this one, and Alf will have his quota of 100,000 pounds for the week. Alf has mixed feelings about those quotas. You know, uh, a fellow with a three quarter of a million dollar boat, or a half a million dollar boat, whatever the case may be, we got a lot of them now. He's given the same amount of fish as a fellow with a 45 or a 50, whatever, and probably, you know, only a $100,000 boat, so... I can't see that working that way. Because last week, we, we was finished fishing Wednesday night. And uh, it was Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and some boats went out Sunday, and it was all good weather, eh? So we could have caught a lot of fish in them three or four days, and we wasn't allowed to fish. So you got a half a million dollar boat sitting to the wharf, and uh, you can't go out fishing. The other years you could load and go. You didn't oh, have yeah, to... every year I declare this year we could load and go. But I had this one five years ago. We had our skull, the old fellow says. Don't you think it's a good idea to space it out to uh, control oh, yes. the catching and everything? Oh, yeah, well, everybody got to have a living, I guess. Glutting it all, bringing it in the glut, they call it. Putting uh, the round fish, because we can drag with those boats, no problem dragging 100 tails a day. So what are you going to do with it? 50 boats dragging 100 tails a day. There's no way you know they can handle that kind of fish. No, you can't just load up no, the ground fish. No, you got to come out and catch 25,000 now, and you're supposed to go in when you get 20,000. Got it, wash it, sell it. You find the bleeding and gutting and icing any problem? Well, I mean, uh, the day is a real good day, but there is some bad days. Frosty, cold, snow drifting, windows all slobbed up and froze up, and the day is lovely today. I was a bit miserable then, but the, the boys are all, we're all rigged up for cold weather. We got the, the insulated gloves you wear today, them red gloves there, we're wearing them, they're, you know, they're warm, they're insulated, and, and uh, This doesn't get hurt or frozen up, No, it? no, it doesn't freeze. Some of the ones on the top might freeze, but the bottom ones always stays, uh, they don't stay, they don't get froze. The day is ending. There's about 25,000 pounds of cod aboard. All of it has to be cleaned. No one is complaining too much now. When we started first, everybody was complaining. I was too. I like to sell it around. I ain't no fooling with it. We just catch it and run it on down the hole and go in and stick a pump down and pump it up. It's more or less like, like the catch is like they do with herring, eh? But now uh, we got to do it. And everybody got their minds made up to do it. And I bet the boys, you go back and ask the boys, they're all quite happy with it now. No problem. Especially all we need is this uh, winter to warm up a little bit. I suppose you get a better quality fish though when you, when you bleed it. Oh yes, on yes, yes. There can't be no better fish. No better quality. They say into the plants there, the managers, that it's the best the quality, you know. I mean, it's, it's coal. Great coal and there's, uh, you know, uh, the fish is keeping good, eh? When it's washed and there's nothing can hurt that fish now. It's good, I'd say it's good aboard a boat for a week. 
the time of year, you mean? Yeah. In fact, it's so cold. Though, oh, yeah. You put your nail in, I mean, you know how cold it is. Fish can't hurt, eh? Because down the hole, the boat, the, boat, the hole of the boat down there, got an inch ice on it all around, and we got ice in the pins, and fish goes down there, boy. You can't see how they can hurt. The work goes on into the evening. The bright oilskins standing out against the deep colors of the evening sky. The crew is too busy to admire the beauty and color. They're probably unaware that they are a part of it. It's easy to see why Alf Gould and his crew and the rest of the dragger fishermen who come here every winter have a special liking for these cold, crisp days off the southwest coast. Oh, I think this is the only fish fish, the wonderful fish fish. That likes the boat and the water and that likes kitchen fish. It does me good to see that old bag blowing back behind her. Loves it. Where are fish now? I think they'll fish right now. I wish we could fish right on through and uh, in July and August tie up. <laughs> Spend some time around parks. <laughs> 